We'll continue with our Bible study. Let's begin with prayer. Dear Lord, you sent your son Jesus to work on our behalf. His work as prophet, priest, and king are for us and for our salvation, and we give you thanks, Lord, that you came to be our prophet, to spread the good news of salvation that would come through you, through your work as our priest, offering yourself as a sacrifice for us. You reign now and forever as our king, shepherding us, guiding and protecting us until we reach our heavenly home, where we will see you and adore you as our king face to face. We ask that you would bless us now and always through your threefold office, O Christ. Amen. All right. So today's lesson is called Understanding Jesus' Work, Prophet, Priest, and King. We're going to start by looking at Jesus as prophet. So we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 18, verses 15 through 18. What you'll notice this time is, in order to conserve some paper, I didn't put all the Bible passages on the sheet. They will be on the screen, though. But the passages that kind of head up our sections will be on the sheet, are on the sheet, too. So Deuteronomy 18, verses 15 to 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. For this is what you asked of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God, nor see this great fire any more, or we will die. The Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. So, of course, this is uh, Deuteronomy. So Moses is speaking. He's promising a prophet like him who will come from the people of Israel. He refers back to when God appeared to the people on Mount Sinai, or Mount Horeb, same mountain, to give the Ten Commandments. And he appeared in a thundercloud with lightning and trumpets and loud earthquakes. And the people were afraid, and so they said, we don't want to hear God's voice anymore. He spoke from the, that cloud. And God said, this is good. So he made Moses the spokesman again. And now he promises the prophet, Christ. So number one, after God freed the nation of Israel from slavery in Egypt, Moses led the people through the wilderness for 40 years. The people begged God not to speak to them directly because they knew that sinners cannot be in God's presence. So Moses also served as a prophet for the people. What things are prophets supposed to do? So be a go-between between God and the people. Yep. What else? What does he do as the go-between? Prophesize. Often when we use the word prophesy, we talk about telling the future. Some prophets do that. Perhaps we can get a little bit more information from Jeremiah chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Alas, sovereign Lord, I said, I do not know how to speak. I am too young. But the Lord said to me, Do not say I am too young. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and will rescue, rescue you, declares the Lord. What more information about what a prophet does is given in Jeremiah 1? Linda. They speak God's word. So it can refer to future events, but it can also be God's will at the present time or God's perspective on what happened in the past as well. So it's the prophet's job is to speak God's word. He will put the words in their mouth. Anything else? From Deuteronomy 18 or Jeremiah 1? Number two, though Jesus is God, listening to him was different than speaking face to face with God on Mount Sinai because he had set aside the full use of his power and glory for a time. What we discussed in last le week's lesson online, 
Jesus' humiliation and exaltation. During his humiliation, he sets aside the full use of his power and glory. When he is exalted, he takes that on again. So he still has it, but he doesn't make use of it. Read John 66, verses 66 to 69, and Isaiah 61 to 63. As a prophet, what sorts of things would Jesus tell people about? Here's John 6. From that this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. You do not want to leave too, do you? Jesus asked the twelve. Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. In Isaiah 63, The Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of joy instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. So what sorts of things would Jesus tell people about as prophet while here on earth? Linda. The good news of our Savior, our salvation. Think of all the I am statements from John the way, the truth, the life, the gate to heaven, the good shepherd, as we'll talk about if we get to it today. So he is the way. This prophet points to himself. Brent. Both law and gospel, as we kind of saw in Jeremiah, right? Well, we didn't go that far in Jeremiah, but the verses after say to tear down and destroy, to uproot, but then to plant and to build as well. So law, tear down, self-righteousness, tear down our misconceptions about ourselves and God, and the gospel to show us the way of forgiveness through Jesus. Anything else that Jesus would tell people about as prophet? A lot of words on that slide. And they're really small. Proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Comfort all who mourn. Provide for those who grieve in Zion. And so we know what the good news is. The good news is salvation from sin and a right relationship with God made for us by Jesus Christ. This, these verses go into what that good news brings, what blessings it brings. Good news for the poor. Binding up of the brokenhearted. Freedom for the captives. Release from darkness for the prisoners. All right, let's look at another section of Scripture, Luke chapter 2. You probably, some of you, especially the closer you are to school age, can probably say these verses by memory. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem. And see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. 
So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. When the shepherds heard the news that Jesus had been born, what did they do? They went to see him. They bowed down and worshiped. I think it's, I, I'm kind of dating myself by not knowing if this is right or not, but I think it's Paul Harvey, right, who says, and the rest, that's the rest of the story. What's the rest of the story? What's that? And now for the rest of the story. And what's the rest of the story? After they see him, they go and they spread the news of what they had seen. So the shepherds go out and tell the good news. Number four, where do we find the fulfillment of the promises God has made to us? In the gospel that Jesus Christ has come. He was born for us. He lived for us. He died for us. And he rose for us. Interesting that that line in the Nicene Creed, right? It starts with that prepositional phrase, for us and for our salvation. Jesus didn't just do this because he could. He didn't just do it to set an example. He did it for us and for our salvation. So we find the fulfillment of the promises in the gospel. in his life, in his death, and in his resurrection. So not just one of the three or even focusing on one more than the other necessarily because they're all part of our salvation. That line for us and for our salvation comes before all the work that we, see, that we t- confess about Christ in the Nicene Creed. For us and for our salvation he was born, he died, he lived, he died, he was resurrected. So we have seen it in his word. Number five, we may not have seen angels in the sky, but we have a source just as reliable, the Bible. We have three passages here. Matthew 5, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus says to his disciples, right before he ascends into heaven. You will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And in Matthew 28, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So what does God instruct us to do with what we've heard and seen? Spread the news. Tell other people. Uses several different illustrations and words. Talks about light, shining that light before others so that they may see our good deeds and glorify God in our Father in heaven being witnesses, testifying about what we have heard and seen. Going and making disciples, baptizing, teaching, with the promise that he is with us always to the very end of the age. Anything else? Anything else God instructs us to do? Kind of covered it. Number six, the shepherds noted that what they saw and heard was exactly as they'd been told in verse 20. Why can we be confident of the truth of everything written in the Bible? If you remember verbal inspiration, lesson one was also an online lesson. (laughs) 
Why are we confident of the truth of everything written in the Bible? By faith. So without faith, it's easy to say, well, the Bible isn't God's word. It, contradicts, it seems to contradict itself. I found an interesting website this week when I was studying for the sermon because that verse, verse 12 in Genesis 22 says, now Abra God knew that Abraham feared him. I thought that sounds kind of strange. So I put it in my Google search to see what some commentators had said about it. And I found this, this website called Defending Inerrancy. And it's just very interesting to go and look and see. It has all kinds of difficult passages to understand, perhaps at first glance, and to see what people have said about them. So if you're interested, it's Defending Inerrancy. Just I don't remember if it's .org or .com. You'll have to Google it. But What is verbal inspiration? Rachel. This is God's words given to men to write down, perhaps with their own style and their own way. It doesn't maybe come across as clearly in English as it does in Hebrew or Greek because it's kind of all homogenized in translation, but all the Greek writers have very different styles. Some are more educated than others. You know, you, if you read Luke, he's a doctor. His Greek is very good. When John writes, his Greek is perhaps not as good. Peter, too because he was not a native Greek speaker. But every word in, the, in Scripture is God's word. It comes from the Holy Spirit to men to write it down. So we can be confident because it comes from God. That's the message we carry too. Number seven, in what ways can we go and share the news about Jesus? Tony. So telling people, right, with the word of God, but also through our good deeds, as Jesus said in Matthew 5, so that they may see the good deeds and say, well, what's going on here? Why, where are these good deeds coming from? That they too may glorify our Father in heaven, absolutely. Any other ways? By the way we live our lives. Showing people what it's like to live in God's forgiveness. Talk about it. Put a bulletin board in your, your house that has the pa passages you love so dearly on it. Let people get in close contact with God's word. Anyone else? Feels like an evangelism meeting in here. Who can you tell? Whoever you come in contact with. Doesn't have to be just certain people. It can be whoever you come whomever you come in contact with, absolutely. Dale. So they come and ask. And then be prepared to give an answer. We're going to look at that passage in just a moment, too. Be prepared to give an answer. Always ready to give an answer for the hope you have. Are you ready? In season and out of season? Keep thinking about that. Maybe we'll come back to it. Here it is. 
1 Peter 3, verse 15, But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. What are some opportunities you might have to share your faith? So in the spirit of being prepared, here's one passage we can use very simply, right? One we all know. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. So having Bible passages on hand, ready to go. What are some other opportunities we might have to share our faith? Some places. Any place where you come across people. So maybe not so much if you're just in your house all day, if all your family are believers. But at work or at school, at the grocery store, if you strike up a conversation with someone. On the dart train, no one, I don't know if anyone rides the dart train anymore. It's, I don't, with the pandemic, I haven't been on the train since last March. But opportunities are all around us. God puts those opportunities right before us to share our faith. We open our eyes through faith to see them. John 1. Philip found Nathanael and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about in the law in Deuteronomy 18 and about whom the prophets also wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nazareth? Can anything good come from there? Nathanael asked. Come and see, said Philip. What can we learn from Philip when we want to share Jesus with someone else? Mike. You don't always have to be the preacher or the teacher necessarily, just the inviter. Invite them to come and see Jesus at church or get them to talking to someone else, perhaps me, or someone else who you'd like them to learn from. Come and see, that's all he says. Jesus does the rest. Brent. When he got pushback from Nathaniel, he didn't argue. He didn't say, well, let me show you, tell you why something good can come from Nazareth. He just says, Come and see. He doesn't give up. I know it might sound crazy, but just come see. Heather. He doesn't hesitate. As soon as Jesus calls Philip, Philip goes and finds Nathaniel. His friend. Come and see. Anyone else? What we can learn from Philip? So we see Jesus, our prophet, while he was here on earth, but also working as prophet by working through us, giving us the words to speak by his Holy Spirit to share the good news. The next office is his priest. I better make sure how much time we've got. Oh, plenty of time to go through priests. We might not get to king today. John 19. Finally, Pilate handed him over to be crucified. So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that the, whole, the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. 
When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Number 10. What problem made the sacrifices by Old Testament priests necessary? So we're thinking to the sacrifices commanded by God to Moses, several different sacrifices, perhaps focusing specifically on two. I won't give their names away because that answers the question. Dale. Dale. So they are sacrifices necessary for sin. There's just one problem. Next, or not next question, this question. Before we get to that problem, which is that they're not good enough, let's look at the responsibilities of the Old Testament priests from Hebrews 5. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal with those gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness, talking about the high priest. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but he receives it when called by God, just as Aaron was. So there's the responsibilities of the Old Testament priests offering gifts and sacrifices for sins, representing the people in matters related to God, dealing gently with those who are ignorant and going astray, bringing them back, offering sacrifices for his own sins as well as the sins of the people. But there's a problem with those sacrifices. Hebrews 10. The law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. For this reason, it can never by the same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year, make perfect those who draw near to worship. Otherwise, would they not have stopped being offered? For the worshipers would have been cleansed once for all and would no longer have felt guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices are an annual reminder of sins. It is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. We even have a hymn that says that, sings that. Not all the blood of beasts. So what's the problem? Dale, you said it. The problem is that these sacrifices don't take away sins once and for all. So they're not sufficient. They're not good enough. Number 12, the sacrifices the Old Testament priests offered didn't solve the problem of sin. Instead, they served as a reminder for the people. What did the sacrifices remind the people about? I think we could say it le- reminds them of at least two things. Joanne. The need for a permanent solution. Tony, I saw your hand going up. The problem of this, I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. And the promise of a permanent solution to come. They point ahead. As it says in Hebrews, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities themselves. As it says in Colossians, the reality is found in Christ. He is the permanent solution. So these sacrifices are a visual representation of law and gospel. Law because the sacrifices are for sin. Gospel because they remind the people of the promised Savior to come, who, like these sacrifices, would take their place on the altar. John, or number 13. When we needed a a different sacrifice to actually take away sin, we needed something greater than animal sacrifices. It has to be a one-for-one substitution. John 1, 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. How did God provide what we needed? Brent. 
the Lord provided the lamb, as we hear in Genesis 22 today in the first reading. He provides the lamb for the burnt offering. And so the lamb takes our place. Jesus takes our place on the altar, the perfect lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, himself perfect, and yet he dies for us. As he says in John 10, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord only to take it up again. Death didn't have mastery over him. Instead, he gives himself over to death. To break death. To end death. To kill death. Anyone else? Number 14, what we read from John chapter 19 gives us a close-up view of Jesus' sacrifice. It wasn't offered on an altar like Israel's animal sacrifices. Where did Jesus offer the once-for-all sacrifice for sin? I'm standing right in front of it. Not this altar. On the cross. Jesus offers himself as the once-for-all sacrifice for sin. So not a burnt offering, and yet he's subject to the flames of hell for us. Matthew 27, verses 45 and 46, gives us another account of Jesus' crucifixion. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Quoting the words of Psalm 22. As bad as the physical pain associated with crucifixion was, what caused even greater torment for Jesus? Separation from God, his God... Our God forsakes him. The Son of God is forsaken by the Father. This is the true agony of hell. Even on earth, unbelievers still receive blessings from God. He causes the rain to and the sun fall and the sun to shine on unbelievers and believers are alike. In hell, people are completely separated from God's loving and preserving hand. But Jesus was separated from God's loving and preserving hand for us. No matter what's against us, there's light at the head end of the tunnel. We will not be forsaken because God forsook Christ in our place. Anyone else? Dale. he's first nailed to the cross he says this is the deterioration and this is the lowest point when, when he's first nailed to the cross he says father forgive them for they do not know what they are doing at this point he says my God my God why have you forsaken me and when the suffering is complete after he says it is finished he says father into your hands I commend my spirit Number 16, why did Jesus endure the suffering of hell? Ephesians 2, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. Why did Jesus endure the suffering even of hell? For our sake. Because we were by nature deserving of wrath. 
If that were not our destiny, then Christ would not have had to suffer. But because we were by nature deserving of God's wrath over sin, Christ instead endured the suffering of hell. As a priest, as a go-between, between us and God, he took the flames of hell in our place. Number 17, we need never doubt that Jesus actually forgave our sins. What did Jesus say in verse 30 that assures you that your sins are completely forgiven? One word from verse 30 is in the window. Belinda, it is finished. Done. Over. The debt is paid in full. If it is finished, there's nothing more to add, nothing more to be done, because it is finished. It's all taken care of. God's word uses a variety of pictures to describe the work of paying the price for our sins. One of them is the name of our church, atonement. Atone is the verb. Atonement means to make a payment that puts God and sinful people back at one with each other. It covers our sins. Atonement is kind of a made-up word, of course. As I see often when people say word, that word is made up, aren't all words made up? But, uh, but it's two words put together, right? At and one. So we should really call ourselves one-ment rather than atonement. It's this payment that puts God and sinful people back together. Reconciliation, you could say. Words, other words that we don't use very often, like expiation or propitiation. Expiation being a payment for sin. Propitiation being a payment that pleases God. It covers over sin. We talk about the mercy seat in the holy, holy, the holy of holies, the most holy place in the tabernacle with the cherubim standing over it. And on the Day of Atonement, the high priest would pour blood over that mercy seat, covering, making covering for the sins of the people. Christ is our mercy seat. He has covered over our sins with his own blood. Redeem, to buy back or to pay a ransom price, to pay the price to set someone free. It's the word used to refer to setting a slave free with payment. And so Jesus is our Redeemer. The word Redeemer is also used in the Old Testament for the close relative who would, who would either avenge the death of someone, the wrongful death of someone, or would marry the widow of a deceased man. The Bible describes Christ as the, bri the groom and us, uh, the church as the bride. Justify a legal term that means to declare not guilty or declare innocent. Because of Christ, by faith in him, we are declared innocent of sin by God. Justified. Number 18. Three passages here. Romans 8, or Romans 3. Romans 5. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. In Romans 5.18, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. How many people's sins did Jesus pay for when he died? All sins. We'll talk in a future lesson of the question of why some people still go to hell. But right now, we are looking at the fact that Jesus' death on the cross paid 
for all the sins of all people of the entire world, of all time. It's called general justification. Because of Jesus' death, God has forgiven the sins of the entire world. It's also called objective justification. It's that it means that Jesus' work to forgive sins is completely and apart from, uh, apart from and outside of us. It doesn't have anything to do with what we do, but everything to do with what Christ has done you know, on our behalf for us. Jesus served as priest when he offered himself as a sacrifice to forgive our sins. John 1, or 1 John 2. My dear children, I write this to you so that you will not sin, but if anybody does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Romans 8. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, and more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. How does he still serve as priest for us today? Even now after he's ascended into heaven. Rachel. The sacrifice still stands. He said, it is finished. Doesn't mean it was finished at one point and then became unfinished or there arose a need for another sacrifice. The sacrifice is finished. It continues to stand. In the Greek language, when Jesus says, it is finished, it's one word. Tetelestai. In, in the tense, that's called the perfect tense. When the Greek uses what's called the perfect tense, it means that it was an action that's completed in the past that has ongoing, indefinite effect. It is finished. It's done. And it still stands. How else does he continue to serve as priest for us today? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has been given to us in our hearts through faith, helping us with our prayers and acknowledging to us this is the guarantee, as Paul calls it, of the life eternal we will have in heaven. How else? Tony. He's at the right hand of God interceding it for us. What is he interceding about? Dale. Dale. The, the sinful nature daily arises and needs to be drowned once more in contrition and repentance as it, wa it was in our baptism. What is Christ interceding about at the right hand of God from this context of Romans 8? So God, Paul brings us into the courtroom of God here. We stand before him. But who will bring any charge? God's the one who justifies. He's not going to bring the charge. Who's going to be the one who condemns? No one. Why? Because Christ who died is at the right hand of God interceding on our behalf. Pointing at that. The devil is more than willing to stand up and accuse us of all the sins that we have indeed committed, but Christ intercedes on our behalf and points to what he's done for us. Even now, not 
huge fan of how they translate it in the New International Version in verse 34. Who has been the one who condemns? They add no one because Paul doesn't say no one, but they wanted to make it clear that it's no one. I like how it goes in, in the older New International Version in the original Greek. Who then is the one who condemns? And he just, just says, Christ Jesus. Like, what? Christ Jesus? Oh, wait. But you're saying that it's no one because Christ Jesus is there to intercede on my behalf. How much time do we have left? Ten minutes? Two minutes? My clock must be off. Mine says six, but... All right, well then let's go back to this. Because we didn't talk about it too much, but we said that Jesus paid for all the sins of the entire world, of all people, of all time, when he died. Why is that so comforting? That, that emphasis on the all sins. Why is that so comforting? So we achieved what we cannot do for ourselves. He earned the way into heaven for us through his death. So in Romans 5.18 it says, one trespass, the trespass of Adam resulted in condemnation. If person could live a perfect life but only committed one sin, that entire perfect life around that one sin would not cover over that sin. And so there has to be one righteous act to cover that sin. The act of Christ. We forgive as we are forgiven. as we saw in, in an earlier passage, right? Follow Christ's example. We learn how to forgive other people even if forgiving others causes us pain. Yeah. Heather. Heather. Even as Christians, we continue to sin. And so we need that continuous forgiveness that comes from the cross of Christ. If it wasn't for all people, there would be many times when I could wonder, well, maybe I was just outside the border of that, that forgiveness. If it were only for some. Grand. If it's not for all people, we might feel entitled to be angry and rage against the people who have wronged us because surely God has not forgiven them. On the flip side, we see that God has indeed forgiven their sin. That enables us to be able to forgive them as well. Their punishment has been served by Christ as well. There are many examples. Today is the first Sunday of Lent when we do focus on Jesus' temptation and we focus very much on this Sunday on Jesus' active obedience, which we talked about last time. His, his keeping of God's law perfectly in our place. And there are, first of all, many examples of Christ keeping specific parts of of the law, right? P First Peter mentions it. When, when they arrest him and beat him, he says nothing. He doesn't retaliate. He doesn't make any threats. He keeps the law in that way. The Bible doesn't necessarily show us Jesus keeping the law in every specific instance we could ever think of or in every instance that we've had to try to keep the law. But he does say 
that all sins are covered. Because Christ committed no sin. He didn't fail in any one point of the law. If you wonder if, oh man, could that sin be forgiven, the passage you want to go to is in 1 John when it says, the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. All is a, is a very inclusive word, and it's not a word that gives a lot of room for wiggle. All. All right, my two minutes are up. Let's close with prayer. Dear Lord, we give you thanks for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross to pay for our sins. We, send, we thank you for sending him to live a perfect life in our place to guarantee that his sacrifice was perfect, that it covers all of our sins, the sins we committed when we were young, the co- sins we committed in our, in our teen years, in our 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, however long we live. All those sins are covered because of your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, continue to strengthen our faith in that wonderful good news so that we may see you one day in heaven forever. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, thank you for joining me here today. If you went to first service, have a blessed week in the Lord. And if you're going to second service, we'll start in a moment. Dale.